right, so it is 6, 10, 20, same gun, same project. Um, we're about four, four and a half hours into it now, and we are ready to put powder in it. And I'm all set up to do it the way I normally do it. All right, um, this is a Satoria scale, and, and hopefully you can read that. Of all the reloading gadgets that I have ever bought, the scale is probably the one of the best things that I ever and I put this off buying this for years this thing will weigh like not to a kernel half a kernel uh, uh, it'll weigh down to looking at it and it'll change you're gonna see it's really awesome um, I always mention my Harl's powder powder measure and people ask like what is that well you go to any bench rest match and every single guy will have a Linwood Harl's powder measure um, and they're just just totally awesome so what we're gonna do is, I've already got everything set up, I already did one. My normal procedure is to throw the charge, put it on the scale, trickle up to within the kernel. This is a, I forget, this is a Saturn funnel. These are really nice funnels also. And dump it in and just, just make ammo. So that's what we're gonna do. I'll show you three or four or five and then same thing, we'll shut the camera off until we get near the end of this procedure. This is a um, 300 Winchester and we're shooting Burger 210s and I'm using H4831 shortcut and we're going for 72.0 grains. Again, I, this is digital. So the LED, the, the readout, I don't know whether the camera will be able to see it or not. But I mean this thing, it weighs to the individual kernel easily. I've used about, uh, except for a Prometheus, I've never used a Prometheus, but other than that, I've used about every system there is to weigh and dispense powder, et cetera, et cetera, and this is what I've settled on. Although I will say that recently, I just acquired a RCBS match. It's called the Ammo Match, or Match Ammo, or whatever it is. It's you know one of the automatic dispensers, mm -hmm. and I've been using it, and it works way better than the old ones. Let's put it that way. Hopefully you can see that. I mean, you watch one individual kernel drop out of there. And what's really interesting is the kernels are very uniform also. Until you have a scale that's of this quality, you're not really aware of that. And so I'm running like 72.0 something. Way less than one tenth of a grain. So when do you... When is too much too much? When is too much too much? Mm -hmm. I try to get it as close to right on 72.0 as possible. So if you watch, if I, and every now and then too, you realize we've got people, lights and people moving around in here and stuff. So this scale, I have one of this, there's another plate of glass. In other words, it can be completely enclosed in glass, mm -hmm. but just us moving around and talking and running these lights in here affects it. But when is too much too much? I'll, if I go over, I'll show you one and I just throw it back. Start over. And so say it's 72.01. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm running in that range right there. One thing I don't know if I mentioned earlier, so, you know, we're using, we bet it, we put a break on the gun, we bedded the gun, the bedding came out excellent. Um, we're using brand new Norma brass, we're using Burger 210s, we're using H4831 shortcut, I mean, we're weighing it to within the kernel. So when I take this gun out to shoot it, which will be the last video, I mean, I expect it to shoot. And if it doesn't shoot, and I mean start shooting right away, what that means is then there's something wrong, which is partly what led me to be building custom guns. 
because you know we were talking about this after we shut the camera off yesterday I mean I haven't even worked with a, a factory gun for years and years but I at the beginning of all this I used to work with lots of them dozens and dozens and dozens and what I found is there was too many too many errors too many situations that too many issues with the gun the guns that was less than perfect in other words there was always something somewhere wrong and whether it was in the bedding or whether it was the receiver wasn't square or whether the, the lugs weren't you know what I mean there was something that was always wrong and eventually I just stopped I just said you know what I'm, I'm not gonna mess with with factory guns anymore and that, let me be clear about that that certainly doesn't mean that you can't get one that will shoot I mean you, you certainly can I mean you can get one that will but when you build custom guns and if you use all the top end components and if you build the rifle properly it's going to shoot I mean it's just going to if it doesn't then there's something wrong you have a bad barrel or something but at least you know what I'm thinking about is when we were when we were seeding those bullets what I saw up there in the throat I mean I really don't like what I see there and so we'll find out is what I'm saying you 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 do what we're doing in the way we're doing it and within the first within the first five or ten certainly within the first 20 shots I will know whether the guns capable of shooting or not and I mean you know shooting well This scale, I'm telling you, this thing's just awesome. If there's only one person in the room, and if there's no air movement and no one have extra lights on and stuff, I mean, it's so accurate. It's 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 off it's off the chart, really. Definitely worth the money. They're they cost a thousand dollars, and you think, holy cow, that's a lot for a scale. Well, after you finally buy one, no, it's 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 actually worth it. All right, so that's the routine. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna put powder in all these and we're gonna save battery and save save card. So we're gonna shut off and as we get near the end, we'll come back. All right, so we've got two remaining. Um, you know, we've been weighing each one out just like I showed you. And so we'll do these last two and then I'll show you a couple other things and then we will be done with powder. If, it, if we had filmed the whole thing, just throwing it out of the Harl's measure. Okay, so see like that one. He had asked me earlier, what's too much? So, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and show this right now, right? So, you saw what it was. I'm going to take one kernel. Hopefully, you can see that. I don't know whether you can or not. So, I laid, laid one kernel right there on the table. And it went to 72.044. Okay, so there's your one little kernel. Now I'm going to do it again, just to sh just to show you, because I would let that go. I, I would I would put that in the pan. So I'm going to reach in. I'm going to get one more. Oh, I got two. Okay, I'm going to put that in back. And in fact, you know what I'm going to do, just so you can see this. If you want to see how accurate this thing really is. All right. Okay, so that's pretty handy. We'll call that 7180. Watch, I'm gonna pick up one kernel. I'm gonna drop it in the pan. 71.844, now watch this. One more. Eight, eight, one more. One more. One more. And that should be it. And there you go. Now, everybody who just watched that is going to absolutely hate me, and your wives are going to hate me because <laughs> you're going to want one. And I'm telling you, they really are. They're just like, they are totally awesome. I mean, best thing I ever had, ever bought. I already said that, but. As far as reloading, I mean, this thing is just like awesome. All 
I always tap that, make sure that it actually goes down so you don't have a bunch of powder spilled everywhere. You notice right now this thing's drifting. When I say drifting, I mean a little wee bit. But it's just because Don's here and because the lights and everything are on. And I mean, it's very sensitive. If you put the other glass panel in, then it wouldn't do that at all. But you got to be able to get the powder in. There we go. And I'm actually going to drop one more kernel because they've all been coming out. Oop, and two kernels fell. Crud. I really didn't want to do that. Alright, so I gotta take one back out. Alright, there's one kernel. And there it is. Alright, now one thing we should point out here is you realize that we're using a factory gun, right? With brand new brass, etc. You would never see that level weigh in the powder to that level of precision you're not going to be able to see that on the target with a factory gun but with a really good custom gun with a really good barrel yes it does actually matter and especially you know if you're trying to get really low extreme spreads low standard deviations at long range the closer you can get to zero the better and by the way that brings up something else that I never never had mentioned on camera and a lot of people don't believe this years and years and years ago and I'm giving credit to Bruce Bear for this hi Bruce Bear right there that's bear dies b-a-e-r years ago he was building guns for me and he had built me a 284 bear a 308 bear and a 338 bear we were using 375 H and H RWS brass as our basic case and then building them you know blowing them out building the you know bear dies or wildcats anyways though and, and I don't have time to go into it here but he was he taught me some things about reloading to get your extreme spreads and your standard deviations as low as possible now you realize if you don't realize but I've had Oler 35p chronographs I have two of them right now forever I mean I've had them like for 35 or 40 years a long time and so I actually have the slips somewhere glued to the targets. I have five shot strings with zero. Zero standard deviation, zero extreme spread. In other words, 3001, 3001, 3001, 3001. Five shots over the chronograph, the exact same number. And I don't mean just happened one time. I mean multiple times. And the way I did it was weighing powder charges, obviously but neck tension. Neck tension plays a huge role in all of this. And of course, you know, where your bullet is, in, there's a million things. I, I don't have time to window it all because it would be an entire video. All I'm saying is, if you really are precise and you know what you're doing, it is possible to shoot five shots across a chronograph and have no extreme spread, zero. Now, okay, switch into this. There's something else here. So obviously we've weighed all these. The single most important thing I could ever teach anybody about reloading is to get a strong flashlight and look down inside each and every case. Because if you do this, you'll never make a mistake. Because you realize here, there's other people now in this room right at this minute, and I'm talking, and my daughter's running in and out and stuff, and I'm distracted, which you should not be, by the way, when you're reloading. So I don't know if you can see down in there, but they're all good. And you, you can even tell with your eye, they're all perfectly uniform. But that. That's the single most important safety tip that I can give you for reloading. And then the next thing is, and I do like these trays, put a lid on it. That way you won't spill it. So again, we've been here for about two more hours. The next and final step is to seat the bullets and that won't be that big of a deal because we have our dummy rounds. And so we're gonna shut the camera off and I don't know whether we're gonna do that tonight or tomorrow night, but we'll show you that also. All right. Okay, we are back. It is 6-11-20. This is day four, and actually it's been four evenings. We figure we've got about six or seven hours in this so far. And this is just a recap. You know, I realize that somebody watching the video, depending on how she edits it, to us it seems like it's been a whole day, but to you guys it might be five minutes. But we started out with 54 new Norma cases. We uniformed the primer pockets. We uniformed the flash holes. 
We ran a 306 Sinclair dedicated expander in it. We trimmed them the length. We steel wooled the necks inside and out. Then we removed the firing pin and the ejector and we cycled all the brass into the chamber. Everything was fine. We primed them with Federal 215 M's. I loaded it with 72 grains of H4831 shortcut. We weighed that on my Sartorius scale. We separated out 50 Burger 210 VLDs and on the other video, somewhere in the other video, remember we made four dummies using the, the um, soft seat method and we got four different measurements which it was extremely unusual. So we have we have one, the short one is at 3909, the red one which is what we're going to go off of is 3915, we have th one at 3943 and one at 3949. Okay, well that's a huge discrepancy which does not normally occur. And if you recall, it's because it seems like the throat of the gun is not symmetrical, which is not a good thing. And we might talk about that again more later. But by putting magic marker on them, the red one ended up with the most uniform, most symmetrical landmarks on the bullet. And that just so happens that that one measured 3.915 and so I have to seat all these bullets the die is still set the way it was by the way we have to seat all these bullets and I'm going to seat them all at 3915 and you realize that's a comparator measurement right that's not cartridge overall length we'll check that afterwards so we're going to start seating bullets and then we'll do the same thing we'll seat three or four or five of them here and once you get the idea of what we're doing then we'll shut it off and we'll come back in at the end now, if you recall, and again, this, this might be just five minutes on the video, we checked all these. The single most important thing you need to learn in reloading. Check and make sure that there actually is powder and the right amount of powder in all of them. And we are going for 3.915. Like I said, the die is still set up as we were making the dummy rounds. So this should be long, as long as nobody touched or bumped anything. Okay, and we are exactly where we were before, 3,990, so I have to go, I have to go quite a bit shorter, so I'll go 10, 20, I'll go about, I'll go in, in little steps, I don't want to go too fast and jump by it. It's always better, in my opinion, to creep up on things than to just try and take it. So there we're at 39, we'll call it 3,960 just for the sake of it. Um, 3950, 3940, 39 about 30. And again, I don't know if you can see that, but you know, all we're doing is pushing the bullet deeper. We're at about 3931. So 31, 21, I'll go about to 20, and then we're going to creep up on it. So we're at about 3920 right now. And so what I'm going to do is, and before I go to, to my final measurement of 3.915, I'm going to do another one. The neck tension's excellent, by the way. Um, when you run that dedicated expander in there, it gets everything uniformed up, and you get really nice neck tension. So this one also is at about 3.920. So it's telling me that I need to go five, but I'm not going to go five all at once. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go four. By the way, micrometer tops on the top of your cedar dies is just really nice. And the thing with the reddings is they're not always spot on. In other words, they don't. It, what shows a thou up here is not always a thou in the actual measurement. Some of them are. Some of them aren't. Um, while I'm speaking about dies, um, you might notice up at our shop, there is a new lawn precision conversion chart up there. In other words, um, fractions to decimals to millimeters. And I've been talking to Troy Newlon on the phone, um, and I've talked to him before. I have his book, The Accurate Muzzle Break. Anyways, I'm gonna be getting some dies, die blanks off of him. And he puts Minotoyo, 
Mitotoyo is the same company these calipers are. He uses Mitotoyo tops and he actually hand laps them. So I'm sure some point in the future here, I'm gonna be showing you some of those. He's sending me a die blank for the 338 Lapua 30 degree improved that you may have saw me shooting in a past video. And so we've been blowing out brass and now I need a, a bullet seeder to be able to go back and reseat bullets. And so he's gonna send me one and I'm gonna ream it in the lathe. And again, I might make a video of that. So in other words, I'll use the same reamer that chambered the gun to build the bullet seating die. But he's building the die, he's building the actual die blank with the top on it and I'll just ream it. Anyways, that's, that's gonna be a separate project, but I just thought I would mention that. Um, Troy Newlon, he's one of the good guys. So we are at 3916 on that one. And we are at 3916 on this one. And if that's what ends up what it is, 3916, I will go with that. Because remember, it's a, this is an arbitrary number. We know that we are up against the lands in the gun. I mean, we know that from, from using the magic marker. So as long as we know we're up against, we only have that one's 3916, so that's where I'm gonna run with it. I'm just gonna let them all right there. So then what I usually do is I just seat the bullets in here and then I start going. But what I was gonna say is um, 3916, we know we're into the we know we're into the lands because of how big the marks were on this bullet. And again, I, I, I know you can't see this. I mean, but you can see that it's it's this bullet is stuck into the rifling. I don't know, at least at least 20 thou. That that land that mark right there is wide. So we know we're in there. So it's no big deal. So we'll start at it's a three three nine sixteen. We'll take it out, we'll zero it up, we'll get ready to shoot groups. And depending on the shape of the group, I mean on, on about a zillion different factors, then we only have one direction to go. We we can make the cartridge shorter and we have 50, 50 loaded cartridges here to do that with. If the gun's going to shoot somewhere between jam and just touching, it will shoot. Or, you know, or it's, it, does, it has an imperfect chamber and it's not going to shoot. And when I say shoot, you know, I'm always, I want, you know, two tenths of an inch. To dream the impossible dream To fight unbeatable um it's usually that's a fantasy with a factory gun but hey you never know so these are all these are all coming out very well, right at 3916. So I'll do one or two more and then we'll shut the camera down. <clears throat> I mean, these are coming out just, I mean, just totally awesome. The thing is, these bullets had been pre sorted. So there's, there's basically two ways that I sort bullets. I'll weight sort them on my Sartorius scale, but also, I will also ogive sort them. And so if you ogive sort them, you end up with stuff like this. You know, all of these will be within within half a thou. So anyways, that's how we're gonna do this. Um, as we finish up the last couple, which will be the end of this video, thank goodness, because it's been forever. And you realize something else. So, I mean, we've obviously have a lot of time here. We've been working on this a lot, but we did not turn necks. And whenever we turn next, then I also trim twice rather than trimming once. So someday we'll make another video of the whole process, but it is lengthy and it takes quite a bit of time, but it's worth it if you wanna put all the bullets to the same hole. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and finish these up and then we'll come back. Okay, so we're nearly done. We got five more to go and I wanna show you something that I would have maybe potentially forgot. And I just do it out of habit. I take these and I roll every one across here. And I mean, if there's run out, you can see it. And these are, these are literally flawless. Now you can buy 
run out gauges from Sinclair Brownells. You can buy one from Hornady. And I used to have them and guys bought them off of me because I just do this. I have to load so much ammunition and I have to go so fast. Just trust me when I say this. If there was one thou run out in that, you could see it easily if you're experienced enough and used to looking for it. So we were talking earlier here about how that just because you spend a lot of money on a die, that does not mean that the die is perfect, far from it. And some dies will turn out nearly perfect ammunition and some dies won't. And the, the thing is, if you have a die, if you do everything you do right, and for some reason you have unexplained run out, get rid of that die. I mean, that's just as simple as that because a good die, I mean, it, it should be, I almost wish we had a gauge here so I could actually put an indicator on it and show you, but I have done that in the past and I used to do that all the time, but it just takes up too much time. But if you run them across a flat surface, you can easily see if there's run out and these are just totally awesome. One thing, so these are loaded and of course they all ended up being, they all ended up being as close as whatever the bullet is, right? So if there's a little bit of discrepancy in the bullet, and of course I had to, there it is, 39165. Three, and so I'll write down 3916. But then the next thing is, and you should do this, in a factory gun you're going to assume they're fit. But right, some guns are tight neck guns. I build a lot of tight neck guns. So the loaded, loaded neck diameter of this is 0 0.335. Now, you can actually, there's two ways you could actually find out what the real, three ways. You could have a reamer print, which you won't on a factory gun. You could use Creosafe and and um, take a cam chamber cast, which is a pain in the butt. Or when you fire these, in other words, measure these what they are now, right? You're going to fire them in the gun. Whatever they, whatever they come out of the gun, measure it and you can assume that the neck diameter, the actual neck in the chamber is within one or two thou bigger than whatever your fired piece of brass will be. I, I, I mean, I, I know I just said that convoluted. But in other words, shoot it me first. First measure it, see what you got, right? Okay, shoot it. Then take the empty piece of brass that you just fired and measure it. And you can assume that the neck in the gun is one or two thousands bigger than that because it expands to let the bullet go but then it snaps back to a certain degree right unless unless it's a, a really huge neck in the gun I mean it, it won't go past it's it's a limit to come back so it'll expand release the bullet and then you can measure it and you get an idea of whatever your actual neck dimension is in the chamber now one of the advantages of course of buying custom guns is you can put whatever, you can have the chamber built whatever way you want it to be built. You can have whatever neck, neck diameter, neck dimension that you want. And so, you know, this right now measures, and just to be on the safe side, we'll call this 336. So you realize you could build, you could use this as a dummy round. You, these could be your dummy rounds. You could send this to Dave Manson and you could say, Dave, make me a minimum spec reamer to fit this brass in every way and then you would specify what neck you want. And so since this is, we're gonna call this 336, we want at least one, potentially two or even three clearance. So say it was a, you know, say again, we're gonna call this 336. You could put a 337, a 338 or a 339 neck in it and you'd be running minimum spec tolerances and the thing about it is when the, when the gun would go off, when it would expand, release the bullet, it wouldn't have very much room to expand. First of all, it'll line it up better in there, right? But it wouldn't have very much room to expand and so it'll snap right back almost to the original dimension and what's really interesting is on a lot of the custom guns I build, you don't have to do anything to the brass to reload it. And I know this is gonna sound strange to guys who, who reload in the normal fashion, okay? But if you have a minimum spec reamer, a minimum chamber with the right dimensions on your neck, after it's fired, you use a dedicated decapping pin, push out the primer. 
I use the same tool to clean my primer pockets. I use the uniformer. Re-uniform, re-clean your primer pockets. And then believe it or not, all you have to do is put a new primer in, put powder in, and reseat a bullet. In other words, a dye never touched the case. You didn't do anything to it at all. Because the original piece of brass and the chamber matched each other so well that when the gun went off, it had enough room to expand, just enough to release the bullet. But because it didn't exceed its limit to snap back, it goes back to nearly original specs. And so you can just reload it. You don't have to do anything to it at all. If you do that two, three, four times, it's gonna work hard, and, and then eventually you're gonna have to use a bushing on the neck, and then, a, and this is just a, a, the logical progression, then eventually you may need to bump shoulders, and then who knows how many firings this may be, but then eventually you might want to full length resize it with a custom full length sizer die. But you might get, even out of 300 Winchester, I mean you might get 10 or 15 or 20 or even 30 firings out of one piece of brass. Where if you're dealing with factory chambers and factory dies, you're always you're always on the extremes of the dimension. So it, it when it goes off, it go it gets too big. And then when you run it in the die, it smashes it down too much. And so you're work hardening the brass like crazy, and because you're abusing it so much, you know, what's I mean an average guy that you talk to would expect out of like three hundred win mag, maybe you'll get three or four or five firings, and then pretty much the brass is shot. Well, that's one of the reasons why that you buy a custom gun. If you buy a custom gun that has, and, and by the way, I actually I should, huh, I don't know if I even want to go here with this. There are many, many so-called custom guns that actually have Sammy spec factory chambers in them. All right, so I don't even call that a custom gun. I may have addressed that in some other video once a long time ago. If it's going to be a custom gun, it should be with a minimum spec match grade live pilot reamer that is set up very closely to match your ammunition. If you do all that, it's just it's so much better and it saves it, it saves your brass. You get way more firings. It's just it's and plus the accuracy. You know, that's the whole deal with bench rest guns. I mean some of them guys are firing that same piece of brass they're literally wearing out a barrel with only 20 or 30 pieces of brass. So we're talking about thousands of shots out of the same piece of brass. Just keep reloading it, reloading it, reloading it, reloading it, and you get extreme accuracy. But that's way deeper than what we have to go, what we can go into right now. So here's the thing. We got 54 loaded rounds. We have four dummies. The next thing I'm going to do is mount the man's, I'm going to wait. I must put the firing pin back in the bolt. I must put the the ejector back in the bolt, mount the guy's scope, and then the next time you will see anything to do with this gun, with this Thompson Center gun, the next time you see this, we'll be out in the field and we're gonna shoot it. And we're gonna hope beyond hope it's gonna shoot one hole, but I gotta tell you, that inconsistency, that non-symmetrical throat in that thing is really bothering me. So we will see you out in the field next time. Thank you.